Hey everyone, it's Horror Free For All, and today I'm bringing you a re-ranking of sorts of the entire Halloween franchise. Yes, I binged all 13 theatrical cuts of every film in the Halloween franchise in order of release, and then I went back and I watched some supplemental cuts, like producer's cuts, TV cuts, extended cuts, director's cuts, you name it. For this video and I decided to do, to do it a little bit differently than I did it when I was franchise horror reviews. I realized that I made a three-part rant series essentially because I was so heated and angry at David Gordon Green and Danny McBride for what they did to the Halloween franchise and especially Paul Brad Logan who was the main writer of Halloween Ends that I feel like that series of videos I, which I know are popular on this channel have become antiquated with my opinions. I feel like some wounds have healed and some movies definitely have moved around on my placement. So I wanted to do this re-ranking because I'm a massive Halloween fan and I love these films deeply. Even the ones I hate, they're kind of like my children <laughs> almost. I grew up with this franchise. I grew up watching AMC Horror Fest, and that's pretty much where I was introduced to these movies for the first time. Uh, that or watching occasional NBC or UPN airings of these movies around Halloween. And from a young age, I can remember, especially on the Halloween night, coming home from trick-or-treating and having to watch a Michael Myers movie or a couple films from the series to really make it feel like Halloween. It's it's not the same holiday without these movies, in my opinion. So, like last time, I'm going to start from the worst to the best. At number 13, working my way up to number 1. And when the film does have a licensed, released, alternate cut or something, I will bring it up, I will bring it up when I mention the movie, and I'll tell you which version I prefer. Okay? And where they would actually place on the ranking if I don't prefer them, <laughs> okay? So with that being said, let's get started, all right? Because we have a lot to go over, and some films you might recognize in certain places, some you might not, but if you watched my last video, <clears throat> when I did the bottom three in that original series, this film has not changed. And re-watching it this past time, it makes me wonder if we will ever get the Rick Rosenthal director's cut of this film because if that ever comes out I'm curious to see with all the outtakes and the unused footage that's apparently out there for this movie uh, how that would play a factor into the film's coherency and what the alternate ending and Rosenthal's original story idea for the film would look like uh, I don't know but Nonetheless, since it doesn't have an alternate cut, it's just by itself. We're going to go with Halloween Resurrection, the theatrical cut, as the worst Halloween film, in my opinion. Now, when I say this is the worst Halloween film, I mean it. I legit hate this movie. This is one of the two films I hate of the franchise, if we're just talking theatrical cuts. If there's extended cuts, director's cuts, TV cuts, and all that involved, there are two other movies I hate more than this. But I had this dead last for a reason. And... I don't necessarily think Rick Rosenthal is the issue here. I think all the positives I can give this movie is the style he brings to the movie. I like the color hues to it. I semi-love some of the soundtrack that, that they use in the film. Some songs could be hit or miss, but for the most part, it's okay. And the look of Michael Myers from the effects department looks way better than some of the films we got beforehand, especially with Halloween 4, Halloween 5, and Halloween H2O, the mask here looks a little bit better, even though it still has the same issues of seeing Michael Myers' eyeballs, and now he has, like, black eyeliner around his eyes for some reason. He looks a little bit better, and I think Brad Laurie's depiction of Michael Myers here, when he's not being treated like a fucking rag doll and a bitch, is mostly good. I like his presence, Okay. Other than those compliments, maybe one last one I could throw in could be it's a good gateway film for a younger audience because, quite frankly, this is one of the Halloween films that could be PG-13. There's not a lot of gore to it. There's not a lot of nudity. 
If you just trim out those things, it could easily be PG-13. And it has this Scooby-Doo ambiance to the story that makes it accessible to kids watching, you know, cartoons centered around the spooky nature. It's a more spooky than scary Halloween film, right? But other than that, this movie's an abomination. It's an outright shit all over the franchise kind of movie. On paper, it should work because this is a Y2K film. It came out in the year 2002. You have the rise of the internet coming to fruition. You have the Blair Witch Project bringing found footage movies to pop culture phenomenon status and then you have the realm of reality tv shows becoming really popular on cable networks and this movie comes to try to fuse those things all into one and it actually provided an interactive scope to the online circuit back in the day with these little webisode series segments where you can actually see a found footage style recording of these actors going throughout this film and recording things from POV perspectives, which I think is probably the coolest thing uh, about this film's history uh, when thinking and reflecting back on to the time period that this film came out in. But everything else presented in the movie was just one big old goose egg, okay? The first 15 minutes of this movie, some may argue, are the best part of it because it ties to H2O, but in my opinion, I think it's one of the worst things about it but it's not the worst. <laughs> it starts off by retconning a popular ending to one of the more popular movies of the franchise, and I'll get into that movie in a little bit, which is Halloween H2O. It completely recontextualizes that ending, takes away from it, and it completely ruins it by ruining the, the wrap-up that that movie brought. And it unceremoniously kills off Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Laurie Strode, and from digging into it, it looks like she was only here for this movie for contractual obligations, and she only agreed to do, like, certain scenes in the film that required Lori to die. <laughs> so, it's a shitty way to start the film off, off with, and then when you get into the whole rigmarole, you get this really just superficial plot dealing with a cool concept, but really shitty characters with bad actors. You have this plot centered around the Haddonfield local college, getting together, trying out to be in this, I guess, web movie of sorts that's going to be streaming on the internet by this production company called Dangertainment, run by Tyra Banks, a supermodel with no acting experience, and Busta Rhymes, a rapper with no acting experience, that just are very hammy characters that you really want to hate, but hate to love at the same time. And we'll get to Busta Rhymes in just a minute. But all these college kids... They don't really fucking matter. The most well-known actor in the whole movie involving these kids is a guy from the American Pie films. And everybody else just acts like they don't want to be there. The lines suck. The dialogue is cringe. And then when you get down to the plot where Michael Myers shows up back at the Myers house and all these people are flanderizing the legacy of Michael Myers, you get Michael Myers being bitched out by Busta Rhymes. <clears throat> and not to mention... When he's doing these kills, a lot of them happen off screen, and you get these cutaways to Ryan Merriman, who plays this horny college kid that's in a texting online relationship with one of these college girls. It's very stupid. And going back to Michael, right? He is depicted as eating live rats in his basement, and it's just, it, it feels like a, a mockery of the Halloween films that came before it. Kind of reminiscent to a film I have above this one, directly above it. But the treatment of Michael Myers is the absolute worst. Whether we're talking about Buster Rhymes kicking him in the balls, knocking him out of the window, uh, wearing a Michael Myers mask, and telling Michael Myers to essentially fuck off and Michael Myers listens to him. Or when you get down to the final finale in the climax when Buster Rhymes is playing Mortal Kombat with him in the garage, where Michael Myers gets electrocuted in his balls. It's an absolute atrocity. This movie sucks ass. I hate it. And that's why it's dead last. Alright. At number 12. <laughs> I hate this movie too with a burning passion. Because I'm a massive fan of Halloween 4. And that's why 
this movie just feels like a complete slap in the face to me. Um, apparently, there is a director's cut of this film in the works. Uh, and I think Dominique Gothen and Gerard is going to be involved with it. I really don't care to see it, but if it comes out, I might buy a copy just to see if I like that version more than this, but I highly doubt it. And it goes to 1989's Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. This film was a rush job film. It came out literally a year after the success of Halloween 4, and because they were trying to capitalize on the brand finally coming back from the dead after Halloween 3 season of The Witch kind of killed the steam for the franchise for a long time. They really rushed this movie into production. But it wasn't really Mustafa Akkad's fault. It was this young director named Dominique Gothen and Gerard who kind of pressured him into doing it. And he agreed with you know payment and getting the film done on time and expediting the script. So Akkad agreed and we got this shit show. Dominic Gothen and Gerard, fuck you, really fuck you for just completely ruining some of the best characters that came out of this franchise from Halloween 4, which in my opinion, like I've already said, Halloween 4 is one of my favorite films of the franchise, and we'll get to that uh, at, later on in this video, but what this film does off the bat is it c completely takes away from the great cliffhanger ending we get from Halloween 4. By building on to how Michael Myers survived the, in, the ending of Halloween 4 in the stupidest fashion possible. He ends up hibernating in a homeless person's hut. He has a fucking weird tattoo on his wrist that never gets explained throughout the, the rest of the movie. And Michael has one of the shittiest masks I have ever seen in the Halloween franchise here. Really, he looks like Uncle Fester with a slick back mullet. I've said it before... And I made a couple people laugh. <laughs> and it's true. Now, because he looks goofy, I, I, I don't think that Don, Don Shanks actually did a poor performance with Michael Myers under the mask. I think he does ha bring this sinister presence in the film when there are good shots of him, you know, wearing the shitty mask. I don't think he's the worst Michael Myers ever. I do think there's one worse performance than him. Uh, but I think he is kind of underrated, you know? And I think that's one of the saving graces to the movie. And I think the climax near the end is a saving grace. This, you know, going through the Victorian-style Michael Myers home, which was kind of a weird change that Gerard went with because he was going for a gothic movie that's a throwback to Universal Monster films and just hokey 1940s and 1950s horror movies. But I do like... The stuff we get with Jamie Lloyd, who's played by Daniel Harris in the final act, and certain aspects of Michael, minus the whole scene where you see him take off his mask and shed a tear. That's one of the worst moments in the Halloween franchise. And then the ending is really dumb, because you have Michael Myers sitting in a jail cell with his mask on, inside of the same jail where he com committed mass murder of an entire police force just a year prior. Really dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> but that part of the movie, I think, is the saving grace to it. Everything else before it is absolutely atrocious. <clears throat> the plot of this movie is infuriating. Off the bat, you silence the best character from the previous movie, which was Jamie Lloyd. You make her mute, because apparently you're trying to explain this residual effects that's going on with her from Halloween 4 that doesn't really get expounded on, ever, besides the first five minutes of the movie just highlighting her just doing shit like this. It's a waste of time. Then you kill off one of the greatest final girls in the franchise, which is Rachel Carruthers, played by Ellie Cornell, unceremoniously, and replace her with one of the worst final girls in slasher history, Tina. Now, I don't knock the actress who plays Tina, but her character is annoying as shit. Dr. Loomis is a fucking lunatic in this movie, and arguably is Donald Pleasant's, you know, rest in peace, one of the greatest things to happen in this franchise, but he is at his worst in this film, in my opinion. I just hate his acting. I hate the direction they took with Loomis. And then Tina's ragtag group of friends with all shitty actors that act annoying. They're all forgettable as shit. And you grow to hate them. And you root for them when they die. Because you just want them just to shed some blood to give some this movie some entertainment. 
down to the music. I think the music is really dumb in this movie. It feels more reminiscent to Halloween 4 at times. But then you have, when the police officers show up, you have clown music playing for some fucking reason. Um, there's some styles blending in with the music. You have these weird direction changes, like I already brought up with the, the look of Michael Myers' home, feeling off from the rest of the franchise. That's just a really dumb decision. Uh, you have this kind of mystery plot going on with this guy wearing a trench coat and a top hat that we call the man in black and he only appears in like three fucking scenes as a cameo and you're like who the fuck is this person and we don't understand who the hell it is until the next movie which had to pick up the remnants and the fuck ups of this film but man it's just it's a, it, a hateable movie it just ruins the film before it it killed all steam going into the sixth film of this original intended timeline of one, two, four, five, and six. And in my opinion, this film created lasting ramifications for the franchise moving forward. And it still has yet to recover after 40 plus years. It's never been able to fix the fuck ups this film had. I just, I absolutely hate it. It's, it's one, I just, I can't stand. All right. So at number 11, this film went down from my original ranking, and I'll explain why. It does have a director's cut, and I'll hold it up next to it. Um, and it, we're talking about 2007's Rob Zombie's Halloween. And I say Rob Zombie's Halloween for a reason, because this is Rob Zombie's interpretation of the classic 1978 movie that started the slasher craze back in the late 70s by John Carpenter. Now, which version do I prefer? Easily, the theatrical cut, which is on this bind-up. The director's cut here, it would be lower than Resurrection. I hate this movie. If only for the 11 minutes it adds to the theatrical version, the, some scenes, they get, they get prolonged. Some scenes get completely changed in terms of dialogue. But the breaking point for this film compared to this, and I'll get into my mini rant here about this movie, is the fact that there's a rape scene in Smith's Grove, that's the catalyst for Michael escaping in both versions, but in the extended version here in the director's cut, it's more in your face and pervasive, and I can't stand it. And I find myself wanting to turn the movie off every time I get to that point. One of the most unrewatchable films in the entire franchise goes to this. So I hate this, and I do not recommend it. So the theatrical version wins here. Now, some of the positives I can give the theatrical version here. I do like Rob Zombie's style. I do think that he partly got this job because Mustafa Akkad <laughs> um, had arranged with M Malik Akkad to do this documentary back in the early 2000s about the, the legacy of Halloween for the 25th anniversary. And Rob Zombie was one of the speakers about the, the franchise on that documentary, and I think that kind of helped him get... The position as the remake director I do think he has this style right and I do think he was kind of that if there was going to be an, another John Carpenter to horror it was going to be Rob Zombie in the early 2000s now that never really panned out for his career as we saw what happened to his films and how much they get critically backlash and they're nowhere near the legacy of John Carpenter's films but I can understand why. He's a stylistic director. I do think all the acting in this film, minus one character, the main character, Laurie Strode, in the second half of the film, they everybody brought it here. You know, whether they were given good dialogue or good characters or not, the acting is somewhat believable for what Rob Zombie's going for. And in the second half of the film, I do like the ambiance. I do like some callbacks to the original 1978 film. I do like the look of Michael Myers and the person who plays Michael Myers, who's Tyler Mayne. He's a seven-foot giant, and he's a fucking Hulk of a Michael Myers. He's brutal, he's intimidating, and he's actually scary. And every time he's on camera, you feel that tension, uh, even though the tension's done a bit differently than the original. It works, right? And the brutality is here. Now, everything else, I'm not a fan of. Now, I don't really hate this movie. I want to stress that. I just really dislike it. And it's moved down uh, to this spot for a reason. This go around, I started to notice more things I just didn't like. Now, I don't have, 
like I said, an issue with the acting. But the first half of this movie, or should I say the first 45 minutes of it, is building up this story of young Michael Myers as a young boy. And he is in a broken home. His mom's a stripper. His sister is like the town slut. And his stepdad or mom's boyfriend is just a big old piece of shit that's disabled that pretty much mentally and physically abuses him and his siblings. And he has a younger baby sister who we know as the audience who is going to become Laurie Strode in the second half of the movie. And Michael just has to deal with this fucked up situation and he gets bullied at school and, you know, he doesn't have much to latch on to in his life and he's starting to develop mental illness and he slowly starts to unravel by the night of Halloween where he snaps and kills his bully. He snaps, kills his sister, her boyfriend, and his stepdad slash mom's boyfriend. And gets sent off to Smith's Grove and you watch we watch him deteriorate in Smith's Grove. We get to meet um, this version of Dr. Loomis played by, what's his name, um... Michael McDowell, who did a pretty good job here. Um, and it's just really sad. And you see Michael's mom, played by <clears throat> Rob Zombie's wife, Sherry Moon Zombie, who actually did one of her better acting performances, commit suicide. It's it's just a hard watch, right? I, I really stress this to you. It's one of the more unrewatchable films of the franchise because it's just so in your face with everything. It's, it's hard to stomach. But when you get to the second half of the movie, Michael is like this adult now in Laurie Strode and she has this group of friends. It's around Halloween. We do get to see you know, Scout Taylor Compton make her debut. But I think Scout Taylor Compton's performance as Laurie Strode is really annoying. She has some really shitty dialogue. Um, not as white trash as the first half of the film, but she has some really crass shit, especially dealing with the scene... When she's talking to her mom, played by D. D. Wallace, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Laurie Strode, I'm not a fan of in this movie, but Danielle Harris, who plays Annie Brackett, and Brad Dourif, who plays Sheriff Brackett, they did great jobs in this movie, um, and that carries the second half for me. But how this whole thing starts off, Michael escapes a rape scene. It's not as bad as in the as the director's cut in the theatrical version, but it's still there. And yeah, it's there's a whole subplot that just doesn't really register with me all that much. Michael just kind of wants a hug from his sister. It's not for me, and it gets dropped almost immediately as it starts. Big waste of time, and the movie just kind of abruptly ends. I'm not a fan of how it ends myself, um, but it's not the worst film in the franchise. By, by any means, it's just a very weak one, and I've kind of grown more despondent over it. I think, really, the, the second half of the film, the part I used to praise a little more, I don't really praise as much. It, it's a good-looking film, but bad writing, bad execution, and just a really hard-to-watch film altogether. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, at number... Where are we at? Number 10... This film went up a placement from my last uh, ranking. I still think it's the most overrated Halloween film. And I think it's because Steve Miner directed it. And it, since he's directed like films like Friday the 13th Part 2 and Friday the 13th Part 3, which I find kind of on the boring side, that makes sense to why I think this film was boring. <laughs> it's just boring as fuck uh, with a lot of issues. And it's Halloween H2O 20 years later. I know a lot of people probably hate me for putting this film at number 10. But hear me out. I think that this movie's overrated as shit. I, th I think it is. And I'll explain why. Now, supposedly, well, I do remember watching a TV cut of this movie uh, on FX back in the day. And that's another one of these movies that I think have yet to come out uh, on physical release or at least licensed, right? that fans kind of want to see because it adds more scenes with a good mask that's shown in the one of the first sequences of the movie and you see more of Michael Myers in the middle portion of the movie going on this road trip from Illinois to California to get to Lori Strode and I think that 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 addition there could help this theatrical version 
Um, because the positives I do have with the theatrical version, I do have a little more this time around. I think Jamie Lee Curtis's performance, when she's not overacting in some nightmare sequences, when she's waking up, shaking around like a fucking buffoon, or when Alan Arkin is not delivering poor lines of just shitty dialogue <laughs> and overacting when he gets killed. The acting in this film from the whole cast is pretty solid. Michelle Williams, Josh Hartnett, Jody Lynn O'Keefe, LL Cool J, uh, Alan Arkin for the most part, and Jamie Lee Curtis does a phenomenal job. Um, minus Michael Myers. Chris Duran's Michael Myers, I'm not a fan of. I know he did put some effort into this role. He tried to kind of imagine what that his version of Michael Myers would be. But I just hate everything about his Michael Myers. And that's just a subjective thing. I don't like it. And I'll get into why in just a minute. But the acting's solid. I think the final 30 minutes of the film, when it's not being held back by some small details of the film that just stick out like sore thumbs and some poor treatment of Michael Myers, I do think it serves a powerful punch as a movie that tries to retcon 4, 5, and 6 and offer a new end of what happened in Halloween 1 and Halloween 2. It's unfortunate that Resurrection came and ruined this ending, but at the time, and if you kind of want to headcanon it still today as like a standalone third installment to those films, it still kind of works. But other than those compliments, I dislike a lot about this film. Starting with the music, I hate the music of this film. The orchestral score of the Halloween uh, theme song is nauseatingly repetitive in this movie, and I can't stand it. It's fucking annoying. It doesn't sound cool. It doesn't sound great at all. It just sounds really just basic and cheap. All right. When we get down to the plot of the story, the coherency of the story really bothers me. I don't... I, I don't care as much because this is one of those movies that it has the shortest runtime or one of the shortest runtimes of the films. So it's rewatchable in the sense that it's a very short movie. It's one of those movies that, for the most part, look visually stunning. And, you know, the camera work looks good for the most part. And there's enough scene changes happening throughout the film where you get a sense where, you know, it's just a casual watching type of experience. And I guess that's why people gravitate to this movie and think it's one of the better ones, because it's so rewatchable. And I, I will acknowledge that. But the problem with it is that the coherency of the story, when you're trying to sit down and dissect what's going on, doesn't make fucking sense. Starting off at the beginning of the movie, Michael's come back in this timeline now. We're supposed to build off the events of Halloween 2, but we have no fucking idea how Michael Myers has come back. It's never explained. But now he's on a witch hunt for Marion Chambers, who lives in another town in Illinois, because Marion Chambers supposedly has a file that Michael knows about. Okay? So he goes to Marion Chambers, kills her on screen, slits her throat pretty generically, off screen kills two teenagers, takes the file, steals a car, and drives from Illinois to California, where Lori Strode has started a new life in this timeline now. And she has a son named John, who's played by Josh Hartnett, like I already mentioned. And she is this dean at this private school. And this, mind you, this is supposed to take place on Halloween. The only Halloween atmosphere we get in this movie is from the opening sequence. And you go to a private school on Halloween where you might have some mild decorations in this Californian mountainous town. But none in the school. Minus one room where all these kids have secretly decorated this hangout spot with candles and decorations and shit. It's very lame. It doesn't really feel like a Halloween movie, right? So the atmosphere just doesn't sell me on it being a Halloween film. Even though it's a cool setting at a private school, it just doesn't feel like it fits into this franchise. It sticks out like a sore thumb in the wrong ways. But when it's not that shit, the movie is just boring with character narratives and dialogue that just are kind of remedial and very surface level, doesn't go too deep. I mean, I kind of get the sense that Lori's just trying to protect her son John, doesn't want him to go on this class trip, but there's a lot of plot convenience in the story because, you know, they're going for a lower budget than it, it actually appears in the film. Even though the film looks like it has a bigger budget than films before it, it feels still like it was shot on a set. 
right? They, they, it still feels like they couldn't have extras all that much. So there's four teenagers and two adults at this school. Michael Myers is gone for majority of the middle portion of the movie because he's in a fucking car. And he finally shows up and starts doing some kills. We get an off-screen kill of one teenager. We get a semi-off-screen kill of one of the teenagers with a graphic leg injury. And then we get one last on-screen kill with a guy getting stabbed in his back. Everything else involves Lori just saving John and John's girlfriend and just being fucking Sarah O'Connor from the Terminator movies. And she has plot armor out of her ass because the treatment of Michael Myers is my biggest nail in the coffin. He is treated like a complete bitch. Right? And I haven't even gotten into the look of, the, of Michael Myers here, but it kind of coincides. In the finale, Michael is stalking the school, trying to get to Lori, and she's going around just punching him off balconies, make, kicking him in the balls, like, fucking throwing him around like a goddamn ragdoll. And then Michael, poor Michael, <clears throat> they had four fucking masks on him in this movie. The first, mo the first mask from one of the first scenes... That mask looks solid, but as the film goes on, you have masks from different reshoots in different stages of the film. One looks like Shrek, one looks like a shedding of Clay Aiken's face, and one's a CGI mask because they totally forgot to edit a mask in a scene, and they had to go back later on, and since it was too late to reshoot it, they put a CGI mask to fix the issue. It's fucking stupid. It looks terrible. All these masks look like shit. Chris Duran, the way he looks, like, hunched over with his head out, looks really fucking dumb. Michael Myers looks stoned because you can see his fucking eyes bulge out of these masks the whole movie. And I hate that in Resurrection. I hate it in Halloween 2. And I hate it here. This is the reason, main reason why I hate this timeline, because it just tries to force in this eyeball shit in the, in the look of Michael Myers. You know, it's one of the worst looking and, and least intimidating Michael Myers Ever in the franchise and I, I just I can't plug myself into the intimidation of his character I really can't I can understand the meth methodology that Chris Duran said he was putting into the character and I can appreciate that I just don't see it on camera it looks atrocious and all in all this movie's just a big boring film hardly any kills there's a very low body count very surface level plot drama going on a lot of plot convenience going on and the ending is infuriating in a lot of ways because not only Resurrection ruins it, it's just the treatment of Michael Myers just gets me. And that's why it's here. Okay? I don't know what else to say. Alright, at number nine, uh, rounding off my bottom five, it's the most recent entry, and it is Halloween Ends. Halloween Ends, David Gordon Green's swan song... <laughs> to the franchise I think fell flat on its face literally the critics the audience the casuals all seem to be united in hatred of this movie and I hate a lot about this movie too I strongly dislike this movie more so than 50 50 being half on it these days I think last time in my last review I said I was 60 40 I think I'm about I'm about 50 50 now this is that has not even aged well <laughs> and I've seen it three or four times in a year since it came out and I can tell you it's a slap in the face to longtime fans it really is and I think what gets me the most and what makes me upset about Halloween ends is that I had such high expectations going into this after watching Halloween 2018 and Halloween kills and liking both of those movies and getting a film where I felt like I was being gaslit by shills on the internet for saying that they liked the movie and um you know, make, trying to make me sound like I'm the dumb one for not liking something. I hate that, and I hate that. I hate the fandom sometimes for being like that, but Halloween Ends <clears throat> is just a fucking mixed bag. It, it really is. It, whether we're coming down to the choices to do what they did in the final film of an intended trilogy, or whether we're talking about the direction choices they did with Michael Myers and um, the tone of the movie even, it's just, it feels so far removed from the rest of the franchise. I think part of the positives I can give this film is, surprisingly, I think this is my favorite 
directed film from David Gordon Green I've ever seen in terms of its style. I like the look of the movie. I like some of the shots and the camera work. I think he brought more of his talent in this film than he did in Kills in 2018 in terms of shots and stuff. Not in terms of um, getting kills right or any of that, but just in terms of the look of the movie, I like. The, the, the songs and the soundtrack of the movie was produced by John Carpenter. It has a great soundtrack. And for what it is, the idea itself, if it was just put into the previous two movies and carried over to this, mov this movie, this would be way higher up. But as a self-contained idea of a film, I can look at the coherency of what they were going for here, and I can kind of understand and give some props to them for bringing something different to the franchise that kind of brought a, an element that was missing for many years, and that is developing characters that haven't been developed in this way since like Halloween 4. And I can appreciate it for that. I, I think Allison, played by Andy Matichek, uh, Rowan Campbell, who played Corey Cunningham, who is this new character that we get introduced to in this film, and he's pretty much like the main character of the movie. I think they gave great performances. I think Jamie Lee Curtis had a had a great performance here as well. Give or take some really shitty dialogue, like you got to find a guy to show your tits to. That infamous line. She did a, a pretty good job here too. And for the most part, I think this film. Does, when it does show kills, the kills are pretty gruesome and creative. A lot of the creative kills, unfortunately, are done off screen. Thus, minus some graphic kills in the movie, this could be one of those PG-13 films, kind of like Resurrection. And even H2O, I forgot to mention that. But it could be a PG-13 film. It's mainly a drama more than a horror movie, and I think that's not even the worst thing about it. But I think the drama is kind of intriguing, and, it, and that's enough to kind of hold me through the film um, when I'm trying to watch it just as a casual experience. But trying to enjoy this movie is just next to impossible because when you get to the negatives of the movie, like I said, the hindsight issues of this stuff not being in the previous movies really do show. I do think the biggest issue of the film is the treatment of Michael Myers. He's in this movie for a collective less than 10 minutes. All right. Now, you do feel his presence like some people who like this film has said about this and I do agree you do feel his presence but his presence isn't really exciting when you have him being shown to be like a Bruce Wayne to a fucking Corey Cunningham's Robin right not to mention this whole element of him gaining energy when he kills people shit is complete left field and was never introduced in the films before so it comes complete out just nonsensical in the delivery and then he's living in a sewer because they burned his house down off screen between the events of kills and ends because there's a four year fucking time jump and <laughs> he's a fucking sewer hermit and to top it all off, Corey Cunningham, he is like this product of his environment killer, kind of like how Rob Zombie's interpretation of uh, Michael Myers was in his remake. And he goes to Michael Myers to learn how to kill. And he has to bring Michael Myers fucking victims. And then he's he gets powerful himself because he starts killing. And teabags Michael Myers and removes his mask and makes him look like a complete bitch. That's a big no-no in this franchise. It just spits all over the legacy of Michael Myers in this movie. And not to mention, when you get down to the final act of this movie where this entire film is building up Michael Myers like he's not a human. They kill him like he's fucking human, grind him up where he can never come back, and just send him off, I think, in a bitchy-ass way. I don't like it. Uh, I think it's very dumb. And it kind of shows the directionless avenue that David Gordon Green and Danny McBride took with this trilogy. Um, yeah. And a lot of it... I think is them trying to create an anthology movie and a John Carpenter love letter of a film at the same time. A lot of John Carpenter's Christine is in the veins of this movie, down to the character name of Corey Cunningham, comparing it to, uh, what is it, Archie or Richie Cunningham uh, from uh, Christine. All the way down to how the 
the romance unfolds and it's just it's not an original movie it's a it's pretty much a stroke fest film uh i think that it was mishandled it, it doesn't really work as a concluding tr uh, movie to a trilogy to the other two movies that came before it that were setting up in my opinion a completely different story that this film just felt like a complete detour and had to come back and answer to in the final 15 minutes of it's just i don't know it's going to be the most divisive movie of the franchise moving forward i'm not a fan of it i know some people are but that's just how i feel okay so at number where are we at number eight we have a movie that's gone down on my list and it does have a director's cut so we're going back to rob zombie <laughs> and it's rob zombie's halloween 2 now, which version do I prefer, the theatrical version or the director's cut? Uh, the director's cut, in my opinion, is the worst fucking movie in the entire franchise. For changing complete dialogue scenes in the film, with Laurie Strode making her even more unlikable than she already is in the theatrical cut, is a fucking no-no to me. And the changing of the ending of the film, where you see Hobo Myers without a fucking mask on, talking, completely ruins michael myers as a character to me and it's the absolute worst moment of the entire halloween franchise and i hate it deeply this film is an abomination like the penultimate abomination of the franchise i think that's why a lot of people hate halloween 2 because when you're re-watching them these days you have majority access to this piece of shit not the theatrical cut so fuck this piece of shit but when we're talking about the theatrical cut, I think this is an underrated film. Rob Zombie's direction here, starting off with some positives, I think is more akin to his style that he brought to the table with House of a Thousand Corpses. And it's a more art housey type of film, and I do appreciate the eye candy he brings to this movie. I think all the returning characters with Brad Dourif and Daniel Harris playing uh, Sheriff and Annie Brackett, did a phenomenal job. Brad Dourif brings one of the best acting performances given in this franchise. I think Scout Taylor Compton, uh, who plays Laurie Strode, did a way better job in the theatrical cut of this film compared to her previous outing. I think that her trauma is really believable and, and it sells me on the direction of zombies going with her character. Tyler Mayne brings it again as an intimidating Michael Myers. I know this movie's known as Hobo Myers. He's not wearing a fucking mask. And Mike, it's pretty much like Rob Zombie's fuck you to all of his uh, critics and uh, the fans that bashed his remake. Because he didn't really want to do this goddamn movie. I get it. But I kind of like Hobo Myers. And I know that's an unpopular opinion. But I just, I, I kind of dig that, that subtle direction choice. You know, just showing Michael Myers' face kind of ruins the mystique a little bit, but not too much because he's heavily bearded and has long hair. And I think for, at least for Rob Zombie's universe, I think it kind of ties back to him being a kid in part in the in the first half of the remake that he made. So I kind of like that continuity there, and I can enjoy it for what it is in, in certain aspects of it and certain flares of it. But everything else is... It, brings it down to a mixed bag of a movie i had it higher than before but now I'm, i realized that i think i was propping that movie up unfairly because i was angry at david gordon green uh and danny mcbride so i brought it down to really where i realistically think it belongs i know a lot of people put this as the worst film i just think it's a half and half i do get it there's no fucking music in this movie there's no ambiance to this film whatsoever um even though i think the hues and the colors definitely bring that cold atmosphere and it makes it work. Just ha not having music in it just ruins the experience of it. It brings me out of it, honestly. Um, some of the dialogue, we're going back to some really shitty writing and dialogue. I think this has some of the collectively worst, if not the worst, written Halloween film in terms of dialogue and characterization. Uh, of supporting cast when they're not dealing with the core three survivors it's terrible uh, it's way worse in the in the in his intended version of his film in the director's cut but here it's still a problem you have like a joke about necrophilia that's not funny it's really disgusting um, 
But you do have some brutal kills with Michael Myers kind of offsetting the bad dialogue, but the d bad dialogue's still there. What they do to Dr. Loomis, played by Michael McDowell, is unforgivable. Uh, he's just awful in this film. Either version, he's just a fame-chasing motherfucker. You want to hate him, and he's just outright terrible. He really is. He's not likable whatsoever. Every, every direction choice possible that you would think wouldn't work uh, really doesn't work <laughs> with this character. And then you have this psychic mind-melding shit with Lori possibly hallucinating um, her mom, her dead mom, played by <clears throat> Sherry Moon Zombie. And she's carrying around this fucking white horse and all that shit is complete nonsensical bullshit in the film. And you see that going on with Michael, too. It just makes no goddamn sense. You could have done the psychic connection, kind of trying to revisit Halloween 4 and Halloween 5 again without that. I don't know why Zombie chose that. It's just so odd. It's just so odd. Uh, it, it does not belong in the film. It's really dumb. Um, and yeah, other than that, the strengths, I think, do outweigh the films below it for me. I, I think it has more positives than people give it credit for i do think it's underrated and it's overhated uh, but not the greatest thing ever that's why it's here you know i wish i could put it higher but realistically i got to be honest with myself i can't put it any higher than where i have it so there's that and i guess we're at the middle of the franchise at number seven we have uh the final movie on this <laughs> little disc here this was directed by Joe Chappelle, who infamously only signed on to do this movie so he can get a Miramax film deal. And it kind of shows this film went through production hell for, for many years after the events of Halloween 5. Uh, there was a producer's cut that was made. They did a test screening. They went back and did some reshoots. But unfortunately, Donald Pleasance had passed away. So they couldn't do all the best reshoots possible. And we ended up getting this theatrical mess of a movie but over time it's gained a cult following and it's definitely made me a fan and it's the curse of michael myers now there is a producer's cut i own it on digital i don't own it on physical but i'll hold my hand up here as a representation right if i had to choose between the theatrical version or the producer's cut the producer's cut i will not recommend if i had to place it realistically on my ranking of all the cuts together It'd be in my bottom five. Primarily for the fucking unceremonious dumb kill they they changed with Jamie Lloyd's character by having her in a hospital bed and shooting her with a silenced pistol or whatever. That was really fucking just dumb as shit. But what really gets me is the whole cult angle actually getting fleshed out in this movie. I hate it deeply. I hate everything about the finale of the movie down to the ending. It's outright atrocious. And the whole reveal with Michael committing incest with Jamie is enough for me just to, to hate this film. I, I don't like the direction of the producer's cut. I do think it's more coherent, and I do think it's more balanced in storytelling, but I don't like the story. <laughs> so I go with the theatrical cut for my experience. Now, the producer's cut, right, it does have that traditional Halloween music that I do like, but honestly, for the starting off the positives of the theatrical cut here... I love the rock rendition of the Halloween theme in this in this film. I love that Joe Chappelle wanted to introduce some like 90s grunge bands in this. And I think it does have that 90s aesthetic to the point where when I watch this movie, it feels like a time capsule. And it also feels like a capstone movie to the legacy that 1978 started with that initial hype of the, of the slasher genre that pretty much ran through all the way through the course of Friday the 13th, you know, Jason's Dead, The Final Friday, and ran through Wes Craven's A New Nightmare, and it ended on um, Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. And I do appreciate it as being a capstone movie, but I think this film, this, this, despite the good soundtrack, has the best fall atmosphere of all the films combined. I think uh, George P. Wilbur and A. Michael Lerner bring a great presence of Michael Myers in this film. I think they're absolutely fantastic. Um, I love the look of Michael Myers. He does look kind of chubby in his gut. <laughs> but his mask look, looks really cool. And he's fucking brutal in the theatrical cut. Some of the best kills in the whole franchise is in this. And I do like the supporting characters. I love Kara Strode. I love Danny Strode, her son. I, I like that this film is 
Paul Rudd's first acting gig. It's not he's not the greatest actor in it, but I like the direction they took with Tommy Doyle in this movie. Uh, I I like that the film kind of brings together a hypothetical. What if Haddonfield banned Halloween? Just outright banned it because Michael Myers is attached to the town's legacy and they're all afraid of it. That, to me, is a good idea. And I think it works splendidly well here when it is utilized the best way. I think the suspense, where the magic we got in the first Halloween movie is kind of here in subtle ways. And I think there's a lot of callbacks in some fun ways, especially with some like sheets drying in the back with a certain kill um, certain shots where he's coming out of a house looks very reminiscent to the original movie. Uh, it, it's There's a lot of callbacks here that I love. Um, but going down to the negatives, the coherency of the film isn't the greatest, especially when we're talking about the theatrical cut. There's a lot of coherency, especially dealing with like how Loomis healed the burn marks on his hands. That never really gets explained in the movie. There's some odd editing where because Donald Pleasance died, he... Loomis randomly appears at a hospital without any context and stuff like that. Parts of the story gets mumbled and jumbled here. Um, there are some unceremonious things dealing with certain legacy characters like Jamie Lloyd, who's not even played by Danielle Harris, uh, but she gets killed in one of the most brutal kills in the whole franchise, which I think is a little bit better than the producer's cut, but it's still unceremonious and disrespectful to the character. But since Danielle Harris doesn't play her, it doesn't really bother me as much anymore. I used to be really pissed off about that, but I've kind of warmed up to it over the years just because it isn't Daniel Harris, all right? Uh, but it is there. That is an issue. And some spotty acting with Paul Rudd kind of gets in the way. Um, the reveal is still infuriating to me. The whole man in black and the cult of thorn tattoo bullshit we had to deal with in five gets expounded on in this movie. And I hate the setup to it. I hate the idea the implication, not the outright stating, but the implication that Michael had sex with Jamie is still disgusting. Uh, but I do like how the ending handles it a little bit better than the producer's cut. I like how Michael, as soon as the element in the reveal of who the Man of Black is, who ends up being a character we hadn't seen since the first fucking movie, which is outright stupid. But besides that, he goes on a killing spree and just mass murders of them all. It treats him like this whole cult of thorn shit was a complete waste of time. And the whole movie itself is a waste of time in, in regards to trying to answering uh, the fuck-ups of Halloween 5. But it's still more satisfying and it, more of like a fuck you to Dominique Gotham and Gerard for introducing the shit. So I weirdly like it. Um, and yeah, the, the ending is a convoluted mess. Like the very ending of the film. Uh, but... You know, this is more of a style versus substance movie. And I do actually find myself saying I like this movie. I do like it. Uh, I, I do get people's criticism with it. I understand if you hate the movie. But I don't. I really don't hate this movie. I quite love it. So yeah. <clears throat> That's my number seven. Now, this movie has jumped up a few places at my number six. Um, I do think this is a good film. Uh, th especially this time around. I think that this is a solid entry. Not without its flaws, though. It's mildly overrated, but not too much so. Um, it's Halloween 2018, directed by David Gordon Green. I do think that this movie could have been the best film of the franchise if it didn't have these few issues for me. But this is a damn good movie. And I was a bit harsh on it because I think the last time I made this you know, review series, when I was franchise horror reviews... I was really pissed off Halloween ends, and I took a lot of frustration out on this movie. But I do think that this is deserving of my top six. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of positives to the movie. The soundtrack by John Carpenter here is absolutely exquisite. One of the best soundtracks in the whole series. David Gordon Green brings this style and this ambiance to this film that's just absolutely magical. Like the way he, this film is shot. It's not the best of his trilogy in my opinion. I do think that's ends in terms of his directing ability. But the film he brings here is definitely the most visually captivating. Because the way he's put, like the way he puts together scenes, it just it fits better compared to the other three. Now, all three films in his trilogy have different strengths and different weaknesses compared to the other. But this one just has a more addicting watch of the other films. You get what I'm saying? Uh, and I, th I think that's why people love this because <clears throat> it just it's just a rewatchable movie. And then <clears throat> James Hugh Courtney 
who makes his debut as Michael Myers here, brings a captivating blend of Dick Warlock's Halloween 2, some Nick Castle, and some George P. Wilbur all put into a blender. Um, and he has that height to him that kind of slightly mimics Tyler Mayne, but not too much, not in like a seven foot tall way, but he has this menacing premise, uh, presence to him that brings brings out this movie. That you have an intimidating Michael Myers. Um, and I think the cast of characters kind of trying to revisit the H2O formula while it's unoriginal, I do like that we get introduced to Allison in this movie. I do think that her character is probably the best character as a, as a whole to come out of this series. Um, and I, I think Andy Matichek did a pretty decent performance here. I think Laurie Strode, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, pretty decent performance. I know a lot of people give um, uh, the actress who plays um, Laurie Strode's daughter, I forget her name, Karen. Um, Judy Greer plays uh, Karen. Judy Greer gets a lot of shit for her performance in this and Halloween Kills, but I think she actually did a pretty good job. Um, other than that, um, I do think this film has some flaws. The originality of this movie is not <laughs> the greatest. <laughs> it's a it's a best of hits film. It's still I still think that it, it borrows a lot from films beforehand. I think they were trying to do that as a love letter and a callback to previous films and trying to honor what came before it. But I also think that disrespects it at the same time because those films had those things going for them and this film just tried to take from them and just make it their own. And it, I think that was a total big mishandle on their part. And they're, they just borrowed way too much from previous films, in my opinion. Um, the way they set this film up is infuriating to me. They try to give an excuse to why all the other sequels, like from Halloween 2 all the way up to this movie, should have been erased. And they start the movie off with like these reporters coming to do an expose on Michael Myers 40 years later after he went on a murder spree in 1978. And that's an intriguing angle. But then they kill off the reporters in a suspenseful scene dealing with some teeth and shit. That was really scary and shit. But that to me just completely ruins, in my opinion, what the story is actually setting up. And then it goes down into the H2O rehash for Lori where they can't decide if she's a broken woman or going to be the hero of the film. And we get this broken woman for 10, 15 minutes of the movie. And then it just goes back to her being, oh, and now I'm the hero. And it, it's a lot of forced elements involving her character with that, too, because she has this house out over in the woods, and she has all these guns, and she's pretty much created a bunker to defend herself in case Michael Myers ever comes back. Why? You know, and you obviously know, because her house is introduced early on, that her house is going to be the, the climax point of the movie, and something's going to happen there. It's very predictable, right? And some of the things Michael Myers does... A lot of the kills look good, but for a 60-year-old Michael Myers hanging out in a teenager's closet to, to scare a teenager is really dumb to me. Like, I know some people think, oh yeah, that feels like the original shape. That's something that the original Michael Myers would have done in 1978. I get that. And that maybe would have worked in Halloween 2 or maybe a hypothetical Halloween 3 starring Michael Myers. But we're dealing with 40 years down the line. Michael's now in his fucking 60s, pushing 70s. And he's hiding in a closet to kill a teenager. What the fuck? <laughs> oh, I, oh, serial killers M.O.s stay the same. No, they don't. Serial killers M.O.s change all the time. It just doesn't match his fucking age, okay? And it, that's shit that just gets to me. Now, a lot of people's big negative Dr. Sartain, I actually like. I like the angle of Dr. Sartain. I think in hindsight, if they wanted to take all the good elements from Halloween Ends and start it with this movie, Sartain would have been the good jumping off point to segue into what happens with Corey Cunningham and Ends. With like this transferring evil shit. That could have worked here because it would have made sense given what we got with Sartain's character. But I hate the fucking way they deliver Sartain when, they, when he takes Michael's mask. It just looks, the way that shot just looks so stupid and bizarre and I, I'm with everybody on that. It just looks terrible. And on top of that, the superfluous characters that we get in this movie, there's not a lot of characterizing going on. Every character is hinged around Lori or Allison's friend group. And they're all superfluous. They all have little to no characterization. You know shit about them. And Allison's friends have some of the worst dialogue in the Halloween franchise. Like with the peanut butter on my penis fucking line. That's one of the worst shit I've ever heard in, this in, in the entire franchise. I hate it. <laughs> some of the dialogue is atrocious here. 
And that seems to be a problem with the David Gordon Green trilogy as a whole, uh, but it's prevalent here. But other than that, I think it's a solid movie. I, I think it's a good mo movie. It has aged pretty well. Uh, it it's gone up for me a little bit. I no longer think it's just decent. I actually think it's good, especially compared to everything else below it. I just love the other movies that I have left to talk about above this one. Uh, but it's still a solid, solid entry in the franchise. So now we're at my top five. And to kick off, uh, my number five is a movie directed in 1981 by Rick Rosenthal. Uh, infamously uh, directed Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> and we saw what happened there just 21 years after the fact. But yeah, this film came at an odd time where the series was starting to become a franchise. I think in hindsight, they should have never made this a Michael Myers movie. They should have went the anthological route, if you ask me. But the movie we got is still a classic, and I still revere it till this day. And it's Halloween 2. And I have here the TV cut to compare and bring up. Now, which one do I prefer? Do I prefer the theatrical or the TV cut? I will say this. I like the ending of the TV cut more. Uh, I don't like how they switch around some scenes in, in, Hollow, in the Halloween 2 TV cut. It just kind of comes off kind of weird. I think it adds almost 10 or 11 minutes to the theatrical version. Uh, and it definitely edits out some things that were prevalent in the movie, theatrical version. But a wholesale, I prefer the theatrical version. Even though, like I said, I think the ending is way better in the TV cut. Um, I go with this version. Now... Halloween 2, y'all. Halloween 2 is a cult favorite. A lot of people still say this is the second best Halloween movie. In my opinion, it just has more issues to me personally than the others I have left to talk about. But I still quite love this movie. Um, I think I'm going to start off with the negatives first for this one. Just because the negatives, I think, are more pronounced for me. And they do kind of detract from my experience of the movie. Um, I don't like the look of Michael Myers in this movie because Dick Warlock, I think his roboticness to Michael Myers is actually a, an added flair I enjoy, but his head's too goddamn big for this mask, which was the original mask that Nick Castle wore in 78. And since it was left in Deborah Hill's fucking room where she smoked like a damn chimney, the mask had become yellowed, but white on the neck. So the mask looks awful, like in, in discoloration. And then <laughs> Dick Warlock's eyes bulge out of these bulges out of the mask. And I hate the look of it. Um, the whole subplot with Loomis takes forever to conjoin with Laurie Strode's plot being stuck at the hospital. And, and Laurie Strode's pretty much absent for most of this movie, and that's kind of a detraction point because she's just literally laying in a hospital bed for about a good 30 minutes. And all these characters, these hospital workers, I think they do try to characterize, but they're not really all characterized all that much, and they're pretty much kill filler. But there's a lot of memorable deaths, because John Carpenter is trying to emulate uh, the competition of the time and trying to outdo them. And this is the film that really made Michael Myers a slasher icon. It's because of these fucking kills that John Carpenter brought to the table. But like I said, you feel nothing about these characters, really, that get killed. They're just kill filler. Well, back to the Loomis subplot. I think it's that's just really dumb. A lot of the directions they took in this movie, dealing with like <laughs> him going on this wild goose chase with Sheriff Bracken and Marion Chambers to find Michael Myers, and they accidentally was this kid named Trevor. He accidentally gets killed by this van, and they investigate his body, thinking it's Michael, and they try to find him. And there's like these breadcrumbs. They have to follow him around. It's just really monotonous and boring. They're trying to capitalize on the detectiveness of Loomis in the first movie, but I just think this it kind of drags up until the finale. But the finale of the movie is fantastic, y'all. finale of the film just hits on so many levels. I think the ending is superior in the TV cut, but the, the way the film wraps up is fucking great. And it's very suspenseful. The atmosphere of the hospital, it does stick out like a sore thumb, like H2O, and I do view it as a mild negative compared, uh, compared to H2O because... You don't really feel that Halloween atmosphere, but it takes place on the same night of Halloween 1978, so there is that neighborhood Halloween atmosphere that you're getting, as opposed to H2O, where you just get a montage in the beginning of the movie, and a little room inside of a fucking dorm room. It's not on the forefront, 
but I wish there was more in the film, in the movie. But other than that, the soundtrack here was fantastic. The soundtrack is one of the best renditions in the whole franchise in my top three films of the uh, Halloween uh, theme music. I like the, the synth that John Carpenter added to the original score. And this, to me, is the iconic music from, from the time. It just, it just brings this movie together. Um, the way the film shot, I think Rick Rosenthal brought some great camera work to this film. It just looks exquisite. It's addicting to watch, even though it can be boring. I don't know what it is about it. It's just something about this film has this classicness to it. You know, you just can't replicate the classic feel to this. I think the first three movies all have this quality. And maybe it's the, the type of cameras they use or whatnot. I don't know. But it just, it imbues cinema, right? It's hard to explain that, right? It's, a, it's, it's more of a metaphysical compliment I can give to it. It's just, it, there's something larger than life going on with this movie. It's hard to explain. Um, some of the greatest tension building in the, in the history of the franchise is in this film. Um, I don't know what it is. It's, it, it's one of those films that probably shouldn't work because John Carpenter struggled writing this movie. I, like I already said, in hindsight, they should have not placed this movie as the second film. They should have waited after maybe they didn't two more installments as an anthological route and then came back to michael myers to give him a, a send-off as like a fourth movie or something but hindsight's 2020 you know john carpenter you know money talks he had to do what he had to do but he delivered something here that i think is magical i think it's a it's a magical film not without its flaws but everything else about the movie that you can pretty much enjoy that i that i said um at least that goes against the negatives I said, is enjoyable. So there's that. Oh yeah, the acting performances are pretty solid from Donald Pleasance. I think this is one of my favorite Loomis performances, even though the whole plot he's given is dumb. I, I like his performance. I like the direction that they go here with Michael Myers and um, Laurie Strode being siblings. I think that's needed for the franchise. I know a lot of people think that pigeonholes the franchise, but in my opinion, it makes it all make sense. It makes it all worthwhile while we keep coming back to these movies every so often when they do come out. Um, but yeah, love this one. Now, my number four has actually changed. <laughs> and it's because this film, even though I love Dwight Little's di directing in this movie, I think this is one of my favorite directed films in the whole franchise. This film and the film, film above it, I, I weigh because on one hand, this film I think has the best story of Michael Myers that I, I just enjoy. But the other movie has the best presentation of Michael Myers, best look, and I think my, my favorite Michael Myers of all time in terms of like his kills, screen presence, all that combined. This movie went down a peg because I, I value the other movie that has the other qualities that I just think are worthy of putting above it but nonetheless that's not to discredit this film i think this is a brilliant movie it's halloween for the return of michael myers now one of the only few negatives i have with i have about this movie is the look of michael myers george p wilbur was given hockey pads and a, and a mask that looks like fucking frankenstein or mr wilson from dennis the menace with a shaved mustache he the mask looks terrible the look of michael myers he's not intimidating He's not intimidating. He looks like Frankenstein, fucking just hobbling around when he's trying to do these elaborate stunts. It looks goofy, and it takes away from the presence of Michael Myers. And a couple of editing mishaps on certain scenes are really noticeable and kind of funny, but that also kind of hold it back. But other than those things, I think this film is brilliant, right? This is one of those homage films to the classic Universal Monster era of filmmaking, Unlike Halloween 5, I think it actually lands in this movie. Um, you get that pretty much from the get-go. You get this <laughs> plot line where Michael Myers comes back after hearing that he has a niece that has survived all these years. And he wakes from a coma. And he's wearing bandages, going on a mass murder spree. Trying to, you know, steal a car, head back to Haddonfield and kill his niece. And Loomis gets involved. And Donald Pleasance, in my opinion, gives his best performance in the whole franchise in this movie. Next to 78. I think he actually arguably does better than 78 in this movie. I love where Loomis has come. He survived the explosion of Halloween 2 in this timeline. He has a cane. He's more broken. He's more jaded. And he's more willing to do what he has to do with Michael Myers. 
and I love that about his character. And whether we're talking about characters now, uh, Michael Myers' niece, Jamie Lloyd, played by Danielle Harris, is a fantastic character, and she's fantastically acted. Her emotional range is so good. Every scene that she's in, when she's having these visions of Michael Myers, yeah, it's kind of weird, and it's introduced in this film, but it looks great on camera. It's very captivating. Even though Michael Myers has some intimidation problems, it looks it looks authentic, and you can feel her fear. At least you can feel that. If you couldn't feel her fear from um, Michael Myers, it looks goofy then this film would fall flat on its face. But because she's so well-performed, it sells it. And then Ellie Cornell, who plays Rachel Carruthers, is arguably the best final girl next to Laurie Strode in this franchise, and I think kind of surpasses her in this movie because of how well she's written and how well she's characterized with her relationship with uh, Jamie Lloyd. I really dig that about this movie. I think it goes above and beyond on the character building uh, I think it goes above and beyond on the atmosphere building. It has one of the greatest openings of the whole Halloween franchise. Dwight Little really knew what he was doing with this movie, with atmosphere and style. And I love all the side characters, too. I, I love the piece-of-shit boyfriend of Ellie's, um, Ellie Cornell's character. I love the, the girl, you know, even though you don't get to see her bare-breasted. I know a lot of people don't like the movie because there's no nudity. But that doesn't really hold it back for me. I think not having that sleazy factor kind of makes it more timeless. And for the fact of the matter, when we're looking at the Sheriff character of this movie, Sheriff Meeker, he is way better than Sheriff Brackett ever was. He's the most badass character in this whole franchise, and I'll stand by that. He's fucking awesome. And this whole militia hunt from Michael Myers, trying to help Jamie Lloyd out, who's now an orphan because Laurie Strode has died in this part of the timeline... It's kind of a sad way to send off Jamie Lee Curtis, but she wasn't going to come back for these movies. And I love a lot of the ideas that's presented here with this connection of Jamie and Michael. And especially the ending. The ending has to be one of the most iconic endings of the whole franchise. And I wish Halloween 5 and Halloween 6 actually answered what the fuck was going on there in an alternate universe. But other than that, holy shit, this movie, in my opinion, is great. It's held back by a few flaws, but I love a lot about it. It's, it, the kills are pretty much groundbreaking, just like Halloween 2 was at the time. Mildly censored because the MPAA at this time in the late 80s was really cracking down on certain movies. Halloween was one. But you do see people's necks getting snapped. You see, you know, decapitated heads off screen, of course. You know, off screen kills of an entire police force, but there's decapitated heads up in there. You see um, somebody getting their head, you know, <laughs> fucking broken. You know, it's hard to explain these kills. There's a lot of dumb moments in the movie, too, now that I think about it. Like the whole witch hunting, looking for Michael thing, has, you know, has happened in other films. There is a dumb moment involving an innocent bystander getting killed. But I think it's better handled here than the other film, which I ironically have above it. But other than that, um, this film was really solid. I love a lot about this movie. Um, I can't praise it enough. Now, my number three, this has gone up for me um it was at number four and i love this film i think this is easily my favorite david gordon green uh film from the trilogy and it has two cuts uh the theatrical and the extended cut it's halloween kills the extended cut adds four minutes with an alternate ending to the theatrical version and if you ask me which version i prefer i actually prefer the extended cut here the theatrical version still works but the extended cut here adds in my opinion a better ending that feels more at home with 1978's uh, version of Michael Myers, and that's why I prefer this version. Other than that, I think this film is not only the most underrated movie of the franchise, not only the most overhated movie of the franchise, but one of the most understatably put best films of the franchise for all the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. Now, it does have its flaws. It does have its flaws. Let me get it out of the way. The lack of plot of the movie... I don't really blame this film for that. I blame part of that on 2018 and David, David Gordon Green and Danny McBride's obvious issues they had with this trilogy moving forward. They made 2018 as a fan service, best of hits type of movie. They didn't really know where to go with the second film. They killed off the interesting aspects they could have built into this movie. They didn't have Corey Cunningham yet because he came after as the afterthought of this. So 
You don't have Corey Cunningham in hindsight in the previous movies. You kill off the reporters. You kill off Dr. Sartain. That will be a good segue point to this film, which is supposed to take place on the same night as uh, Halloween 2018. So it pretty much is just a Michael Carnage Candy Rampage movie where he survives the ending of 2018, which I don't know if I brought that up as a strength to 2018, but... 2018's ending I'm actually a pretty big fan of and this movie starts off with a fucking blaze of glory Michael's going on a killing spree it picks up pretty much seamlessly where the previous movie left off Lori's rushed to the hospital she has injuries and Michael is going on a rampage going through town going on a killing spree and the town's getting pissed off and part of the part of the reason why this is going on is because legacy characters like you have Tommy Doyle who's now made a reappearance Lindsay Wallace, who has now made a reappearance, um, you have Anthony um, Michael Hall playing Tommy Doyle, and you have, um, I forget her name, um, but the original actress of uh, Lindsay Wallace is has come back to, um, you know, talk about the events of 78, and you have this new character, uh, oh yeah, you also have Marion Chambers, but you have this new character providing a flashback. And you get this flashback to 1978, and I think the flashback of this film is fucking phenomenal. What they were able to do with this movie, with that flashback, makes me think that, in hindsight, they should have made this movie a, a whole flashback film. But it was still great. <clears throat> but like I said, I kind of got off into a tangent there. You have a lot of good things starting this movie out, but the rest of the movie is just really no plot. It's just Michael going around killing people, and this mob going on this mob mentality... When you have this repetitive dialogue shit going, evil dies tonight. That's the second negative. Fucking evil dies tonight. Big negative to the movie. You know, it is annoying. It gets in the way. Uh, and also the comedy of this movie, it does lean a little more into the, the horror comedy than the rest of the Halloween franchise. It's a lot more in-your-face jokes. They actually have comedy actors in here um, playing certain characters. But other than that, and other than those negatives... I think this film, this extended cut here, is a fucking fantastic movie. I've already brought up some of the strengths, like the flashback scene is great. I love the legacy characters in this movie. I know a lot of people have issues with Tommy Doyle and how they think he's kind of an idiot in this movie and the whole mob mentality being caused by him and them going on a wild goose chase for this other Smith's Grove patient that was featured for a brief second on a uh, you know news bulletin. Some parents are up in arms about that because they're like this guy looks nothing like michael myers how could they ever mix the two up well it was only shown for a brief second but i get i get if you have some animosity towards tommy doyle's character but i don't i i, I think it does kind of bring that layer to the film it is talking about mob mentality it is talking about how evil can be infectious you know that's going on with Lori strode and officer hawkins dialogue and officer hawkins i don't know if i brought that up with 2018 either but he does a great job in this movie too talking about his experience when he's bringing up that flashback and stuff and that ties into the character that you know the one of the legacy characters that are a part of the survivor group in the beginning of the movie i think all that works splendidly well and i love the easter eggs in this movie tying back to season of the witch i love some easter eggs to other halloween movies i think that the Easter eggs were done way better in this film than 2018. And uh, I like the connection to the Myers home and getting the update we got with like Big John and Little John. I love the comedy with them. Um, and the way they died is very reminiscent to some things we got in 2018 and 1978's Halloween with Michael Myers. How he kills them is brutal as shit. And that goes to every other character that dies in this movie. The kill count is outrageous in this film. And pretty much every kill that goes on is brutal in this fucking movie and to top it all off and i think this puts the cherry on top i think amy matichek who plays uh allison the side the side story that she got with her you know piece of shit boyfriend who ends up being the son of the new survivor we meet is very, very intriguing and i think that sets her up really good to get that characterization we got in halloween ends and i think her character is still one of the best saving graces of this movie now, some characters do unceremoniously die, pretty much as, a, as they get introduced. You have Sheriff Brackett, you have Tommy Doyle, you have um, Karen, who's Lori Strode's daughter. They all may or may not get the axe right, and that may piss some fans off, 
But I like that. I like that if we're going to have this finality trilogy that you make some big, bold swings trying to kill off some legacy characters. And I love the way this film ends off and tries to set up the next film. I don't really get why people are up in arms about it, about this movie. I mean, I do. It doesn't have a plot to it. It's just a Carnage Candy Michael Myers movie. But that's why I love it, right? If you're going to have a film 40 years after the fact of the original movie, this is what I think you should do. I don't want the same song and dance as 1978 because that's a perfect movie. I don't need another 1978. I don't need another H2O. I don't want another H2O, actually, but I don't need that. We have already been there, done that. I wanted my own experience here. And we never really got that Carnage Candy experience with Michael Myers until this movie. And the more I watch this film, I love it more and more and more. One of my favorite movie experiences of all time, going to see it in the theaters. This film was actually filmed in my hometown, too, and I love that I have that connection to it as well. But I think this movie is just really great. Truly great. Held back by some flaws but still a solid film nonetheless all right now at number two and my number two and my number one can honestly be interchangeable but this go around i have to be honest with myself uh, i love this movie it's one of my favorite movies of all time um but do i think it's better <laughs> i don't know some years i think this movie's better some years i don't like my last review i thought this one was better but i still think tommy lee wallace and I forget Nigel Neal and John Carpenter, all three of these people brought something really good to the script of this movie. And Tommy Lee Wallace is directing, um, mixed with the acting ensemble here with Stacey Nelkin, with Tom Atkins, Dan O'Hurley. They made a fantastic movie. And it's one of the two masterpieces, in my opinion, of the, of the series. And it's Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Yes, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch is a fucking phenomenal movie. Phenomenal movie. I have no negatives with it. If I had any mild things with it that I could be harsh on, but I'm not going to be, is that the movie does have this slow pace to it. And near the end, there is this consternation with fans about what happens with Stacey Nelkin's character and how that kind of does comes out of left field. I can see that, but in my opinion, I've already explained it in my review of this film. You can go watch it on my channel. I get what they what they were setting up there, and I saw the explanation. And that's why I don't view that as a negative. But everything else about this movie is perfect. From Tommy Lee Wallace's directing, to the atmosphere of the movie, down to the, the creativity of the film, this film is nothing like anything else you've ever seen. The closest thing is Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And I think Tommy Lee Wallace said it best. That's the closest thing to it, but it's still not quite like that. Nigel Neal, who originally wrote the script, brought something really original to the table. And John Carpenter and Tommy Lee Wallace edited the script that he wrote, which pissed them off. But what turned out out of that was just a great movie and a great story. And... Tom Atkins plays one of the greatest anti-heroes of all time, with Dr. Don Chalice. Um, he just he just embodies that anti-hero that you just don't get out of much films, especially horror films. But, you know, he's going on this journey, this mystery. There's a mystery aspect that's captivating. You want to know what the fuck's going on. This sets up, there's this thing set up in the beginning on this news where a piece of Stonehenge was stolen. You're like, all right, we have a piece of Stonehenge being stolen. You have these men in suits going around, chasing this, chasing this guy in a junkyard, end up finding him, killing him, and in this hospital, and you're like, what the fuck's going on with that? And they blow themselves up, and they imply to be like robotic cyborgs. And you're like, okay, where, where the fuck is this story going? And then it just goes down this route of this magic and sorcery element where these masks built by this silver shamrock company have this, you know, Halloween origin to them that go back to ancient Ireland and stuff and goes back to the, the rituals of Sam Hain or Salmon as they say in the movie it's just wild and fucked up some graphic ass shit you can't see in this movie dealing with these masks especially dealing with a kid's death um, there's some gruesome body horror the makeup effects in this movie look fantastic some kills you got a guy getting his head ripped off fucking uh, a woman gets a beam shot in her fucking mouth that looks gnarly a guy gets his nose 
popped out of his socket and you hear this loud crunch it looks disgusting and then you see a decapitation i mean like what the fuck there's a lot of just in your face shit about this film and it's great it's greatly done and dan o'hurley who plays connell cochran is one of the greatest movie villains of all time and this plot which should not work on paper i think works because he's able to captivate us and the in not if it's not the acting that's captivating it's the music the addicting music going around and this unsettling theme song of um london bridge is falling down but done in an original score is like happy happy halloween that playing just adds to the tension throughout this movie and adds to the mystery element of what they're trying to figure out what's going on with this town and it's just the way the film wraps up when you get the answers and you feel dr don chalice you know is trying to save the day but it cliff hangs on that fucking down note. It's just one of the greatest downer endings in film history. It's just everything comes so together so perfectly with this film. I don't know how to explain it. I know it was a hated movie back in the day because people said, oh, there's no Michael Myers in it. Poor advertising, whatever the fucking case may be. People these days still say it's a boring movie. People still put it low on the on the on their lists, but there's a lot of people giving it credit where it's due. And in a lot of ways, this is my favorite movie of the franchise. But there's a certain cut of a certain movie above this that I love more. And I have to be honest. But I love everything about this theatrical cut. I think it's genuinely perfect. Genuinely a perfect film. One of my favorite films of all time. But I have to put my number one where it's due. And it's going to be 1978's Halloween, directed by John Carpenter. Uh, you know... The team of Deborah Hill, um, Tommy Lee Wallace, Dean Cundey, Nick Castle playing The Shape. You know, you have Jamie Lee Curtis playing Laurie Strode. So many great ensemble casts in this film. Um, this revolutionized horror movies. This movie revolutionized uh, the slasher genre. made it popular. Uh, put slasher movies on the map and created a subgenre that fans are still obsessed with over till this day. Without Michael Myers, who knows what we would have gotten in film history. I mean, without this movie, it's safe to say that a lot of slashers wouldn't exist. We owe a lot of what we love in the horror genre to this movie and to John Carpenter, everyone involved with this movie. Now, which version I'd prefer, the theatrical or the um, extended cut here, which was made for the TV, right? I love both. I think they're both perfect. Uh, the theatrical cut does have its mild flaws, though, and that's why I prefer the extended cut extended cut here the theatrical version i think without the extended cut scenes that add a lot more exposition to um, dr loomis's character flushing that out and adding some cooler uh trippy scenes dealing with Lori and like some visions of michael and stuff uh and some extent and extensions um to some coherency of the uh, of the theatrical version's plot i think the theatrical version is fine as is but i think Lori strode's acting is a lot more jarring it's a lot more simplified this movie's like a 92 93 minute film and i just don't feel like we get enough glory in this movie and that's like the only nitpick i have with it i don't think Lori's the best here but everything about it's perfect but here it's similar similarly the same issue but i think the coherence is just a little bit better and i like that the movie's fluffed up to an hour and 45 minutes and i love everything to add to it and uh i don't know this is the version when I grew up watching Halloween, this was the first Halloween movie I ever saw. This was the version I saw on TV. This is the version that my grandfather had recorded. This was the version that I got introduced to. This is my gateway to the series. And this is pretty much why I love this series. This version here, at least. So I have to put this as my number one. Even though I think I love Season of the Witch more than the theatrical version of this movie. I love this. I love this. Um... It's just a simple story of this, you know, you have a time of year being Halloween. You have this kid opening this, opening the movie. He's wearing a mask. He's breathing. You see the mask over the camera. He ends up killing this girl that's revealed to be a sister. And it cliffhangs and it continues on with the time jump. And you see the killer that this kid has become has escaped on a rainy night. It's about to be Halloween. And his doctor, played by... Donald Pleasance, who did one of his best performances in this franchise, playing the character, is out to try to find 
is patient and he's going around stalking this girl who's a high schooler right and she's like a babysitter she babysits local kids it's going to be halloween night she's going to babysit some kids while her friends are going to be out partying doing whatever but her friends end up getting killed off and she's pretty much left alone you know you have that tension there building through this whole movie you have this cat and mouse feel where this killer is just you feel his presence even though you don't see him on screen you feel his presence it's just a masterful way of displaying terror on screen it's just it's never been able to be completely replicated and, and that's a testament to this movie i think where a majority of people tend to fail with making halloween sequels is that if you literally just look at the blueprint that halloween 78 put put into the forefront if you just capture that stalker, that presence that's always looming, if you capture the coherency of you know building characters like Halloween Four, right, or if you you know capture the brutality of Michael Myers, mixing in when he does do some kills, make them brutal like Halloween Kills. If you combine combine the best elements from what I said about Kills, Halloween Four, and Seventy Eight, and made it to a legacy sequel. I think that would be the, the time, if you could do it perfectly, would be the only film that could rival this film. Or Season of the Witch. No other film has been able to get it right. But that's a testament to this movie, like I said. It's just so simple. You know, it was creating a genre. Well, it didn't create the genre, but it was creating what would come later in the genre. With these tropes. Like the final girl. You had the final girl trope. You have... Um, the babysitter trope you have the the killing all the the, the people who have sex <laughs> and drink trope right this film starts it all and it's done so greatly and there's just something about this the look and the presence of michael myers is haunting nick castle even though he said that he was just walking in a mask the mask the the the, the way that they made just uh a a <laughs> What is it? Captain Kirk? I think that's his name. A Captain Kirk mask and spray painted it white and dyed the hair black. The way they made just made that look terrifying. Just a blank face, just a shape of evil, come to life on screen. It's just magical. It's it's pure cinema magic. It's one of the greatest movies of all time. That and Season of the Witch, in my opinion, are the two masterpieces of the franchise. You can't go wrong with Halloween 1978. But like I said, I do prefer the extended cut just just because you get more. And the fact that John Carpenter and Deborah Hill and everybody, um, when they got the TV contract, they needed to make the film longer to be able to show it on syndicated television. So they went back and added 12 minutes to the movie, and they shot it within three days. And the fact that everything they added within three days to this film was fucking fantastic blows my mind. And it shows the, the magnitude and the capability of people, the people who made this film. And this film is a cinematic treasure. Um, I, I think... Like I said, I prefer the extended cut, but they're both cinematic treasures. I mean, they really are. Uh, I just prefer this one. This is, this is my favorite film of the Halloween franchise. So, yeah, that was a long video, y'all. I hope that if you stayed through the whole thing that you enjoyed yourself, you enjoyed my opinions. Let me know down in the comment section. Do you love this franchise? Uh, what would your ranking be? Uh, let me know. I, I, I love talking about the series with people. I'm just a massive fan. Um... Thank you all for watching. If you like the video, please subscribe, uh, hit the like button, do whatever you got to do, and I'll see you next time.